Well, good afternoon, brethren. Certainly is good to see everybody here on this beautiful Sabbath day. We'd like to welcome everybody that's tuned in out there in Portland. We're having a great day here. Happy Sabbath to you all. It is time now to begin services, so I'd like to call on uh, Mr. Eric Lee to come forward for the opening prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your Sabbath day and the opportunity we have to be here congregating together to meet together and to worship you. And please, Father, just place your, your presence here and inspire the speaking and inspire our hearing and help us to draw out of this message what we need. And please just be with all your people around the world. Please especially be with those that are sick and that can't be here for one reason or another and be with all your people around the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Brethren, if you'll take your hymnals, turn over to page number 44, we'll sing, Save Me, O God, by Thy Great Name. That's page number 44 in the older hymnal, page number 70 in the newer. good beginning brethren the words the from the 54 psalm for our next hymn if you'll turn over to page number 14 we'll sing who shall dwell on thy holy hill it's page number 14 in the older hymnal page number 31 in the newer
again, an excellent, excellent hymn. Um, for our next selection, if you'll turn over to page number 34, we'll sing, Oh God, We Have Heard. That's page number 34, if you're using the older hymnal today, page number 61 in the newer. be seated, brethren. Now to bring us today's sermon is Mr. Steve Buchanan. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Greetings to those out west. Glad to have you with us. Hopefully everyone there is doing well. Us here, we've got a nice sunshiny day, very humid, and as is the case most of the time when you gather God's people in one place, when you get a bunch of hot air in one room, it gets pretty warm, so hopefully all of us will cool off here in due time. To begin, I'd like to ask you to turn to the 8th Psalm, Psalm chapter 8. Those who were on the camp out last week are going to hear a few verses starting out here that we covered last week. When it comes to thinking about God's Word, meditating on God's Word, sometimes I will take a scripture or several verses and meditate on it for quite a while. And as I've done that since our camp out, some of the points that I covered last week, we're going to go ahead and we're going to repeat in some respect, but we're going to go a lot deeper as far as our responsibilities are concerned. So beginning in the 8th Psalm, we'll start here with verse 1. It says, O Lord, our Lord... This is a prayer of David. This is his psalm. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name. I think those students of the Bible, if you've read this many times, you understand the meaning behind this word name. It's talking about God's character, his attributes, what he's able to see and witness and he's able to think about and meditate on. How excellent is your name in all the earth. So it's not just his one locale that he's thinking about, but it's in all the earth who have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength. So David begins to think about here what God has ordained. And what we're going to see, especially in these first three verses, contains just that. What God ordains, that is what he's thinking about. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength. And I can only imagine as David made those statements, he was thinking of his own life. Here he was, all of his brothers, Samuel went to first thinking that's who God was going to ordain king. But David was the youngest. David was the one who wasn't looked at. And again, it's not David's status that he's thinking about. This is going to come into play later in the sermon. 
It's what God ordained. He purposed because of your enemies that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. Again, David's not emphasizing himself. He's emphasizing what God's plan is, what God is going to do. Verse 3. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained. And again, as we mentioned last week at the camp out, as we have the opportunity, and I think our ancestors had a lot better view than what we do when we look up at the night sky and what few stars we're able to see today doesn't compare to what David was able to see. When he looked up at the sky and he saw all those lights, I remember as a, as a youngster, I would have been knee-high to a grasshopper going to my mom's parents. They lived down on a farm in southern Illinois, away from all the big cities. Uh, they have a lot of acreage. I remember going outside one time, for the first time I ever remember this, going outside at night, looking up and just being astounded. I just stopped in my tracks and I just looked around because I'd never seen anything like this before. Stars from one end of the horizon to the other. It's just incredible. But what David was doing, it wasn't just growing in awe of everything he could see. Again, the emphasis, what God had ordained. Verse 3, the moon and the stars which you have ordained. His purpose, his creation, his plan, and David was meditating on all of that. All of this was the thoughts of David reflecting in his mind pertaining to the excellence of God's name. Hold your place here, the 19th Psalm. Psalm 19, verse 1. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God. When we look up into the sky, we don't hear anything coming back. What is declared is something that, in this case, David is stating God was giving to him. He was able to see and understand what he was able to see and all of its function and God's ordained purpose in it only by what God was declaring to him. That's what he was hearing. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork, his purpose, his plan. Verse 2, day unto day utters speech and night unto night reveals knowledge. This speech never stops. It's there day after day, night after night. As we reflected at the camp out, as I asked myself, how often do I even think about the purpose of God in what I'm able to see and witness around me? The purpose God has, the functioning of all of it. Verse 3 there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. It doesn't matter what nationality you are. It doesn't matter if you can read or not. This message, what's being declared, is available for all that God gives eyes to see and ears to hear. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them, he, God, has set a tabernacle for the son, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. Everything the sun reaches, the sun heats. That's what he sees. That's what he can see. Turn to the 104th Psalm. Psalm 104, verse 14. So far, we focused a lot 
about the stars, the sun, what we see above us, the firmament in space. Verse 14, he, God, causes the grass to grow for the cattle. He's now focusing, this isn't David, doesn't say specifically David, this is just a psalm, but he causes the grass to grow for the cattle. God's purpose, God ordained the grass to grow to feed cattle. This is his purpose. And vegetation for the service of man. That he may bring forth food from the earth and wine that makes glad the heart of man oil to make his face shine, and bread which strengthens man's heart. The trees of the Lord are full of sap, the cedars of Lebanon which he planted, where the birds make their nests. The stork has her home in the fir trees. It's not just a matter of looking at a tree, admiring the stature of it, admiring what it produces, but he's even able to see that the tree God purposed and ordained for it to be home for certain of the animals. God's details in his plans are right before us. Verse 18, the high hills are for the wild goats. The cliffs are a refuge for the rock badgers. Much of that area we're not able to do a whole lot with, other to think about or climb and to get to a certain perspective and have a view but in God's plans, they're home for some of the animals. 19, he appointed the moon for seasons. The sun knows it's going down. This earth has to remain in orbit, perfect orbit, for the moon and the sun to continue to be seen, to continue to have the earth feel the effects of what God ordained. Verse 20, you, God, make darkness and it is night in which all the beasts of the forest creep about. The young lions roar after their prey and seek their food from God. As we mentioned at the camp, I doubt that any of us really think about when we go to bed at night, what are the lions going to do for their food? What are wild animals going to do for their food? I doubt any of us think about it, but God's concerned, God's functioning, everything that's around us, he's involved with. Verse 22, when the sun rises... They gather together and lie down in their dens. Again, this is going to be the order that God originally purposed this, that at night lions would go out and seek their prey, but when the sun would come out, they would go in their dens and rest. And when the sun comes up, verse 23, man goes out to his work and to his labor until the evening. O Lord, how manifold are your works! Again, taking the time to think about the functioning of everything that we see brings this conclusion to this psalmist. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. This great and wide sea in which are innumerable teeming things, living things both small and great. I'm one who always loved to go to Florida for the feast. And I love to sit on the balcony and just look out at the gulf, all of this expanse of water, and just think about God's purpose for all of it. And this psalmist beginning to think all of the living things that are throughout all of the waters of the earth. His thinking goes back to God's purpose behind it. Verse 26, there the ships sail about. There is that Leviathan. Now, this is talking about a sea creature that he was able to see, a giant sea creature, which you have made to play there. Verse 27. These all wait for you that you may give them their food in due season. As we're going to think about as we progress, everything that we thought about so far, any part of creation that we could think about, no part of it is self-sufficient. Not one aspect of it. And it's going to include you and me. We're going to get to that. Verse 28, what you give them, they gather in. You open your hand, they are filled with good. You hide your face, they are troubled. You take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. You send forth your spirit, they are created. 
and you renew the face of the earth. These verses end with what God purposes, supplies, chooses to withhold, and what he chooses to maintain. God's purpose, his creation, what he ordains that should happen. What God ordains is, again, the theme throughout all these functions within creation. But of all the physical creation, mankind is the only part that's different. I want to go back to the eighth psalm. And here I want to begin reading with verse 4. After David thought about the starry skies, as the some of the verses that we have thought about, not just what we see in the firmaments, but even what we see all around us every day, David asks this question. What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him, that you give attention, you care for him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, or the, as the Hebrew is Elohim. You have made him a little lower than Elohim, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. Of all the creation that we could look and witness, that many of which that we just stand back in awe of, and what God is doing, what God has purposed, of all of it, Mankind is the only one that is not pre-programmed to function. Trees are functioned a certain way, programmed a certain way. Animals, by instinct, are programmed a certain way. But all of us were born not programmed any certain way because God purposed and ordained that all of us choose which way we're going to live our lives. To choose whether we are going to fit in within the creation of God to function as he instructs. David came to the point where he asked these very meaningful questions, questions we've read many times. What is man? What is special about us? What is God doing? And, he, and again, it centers around what God has ordained, what God has purposed in these verses. Just like all of the creation, though, we are not self-sufficient either. All of us have needs every single day. We require air to breathe, water to drink, food to eat. We need to sleep. We need that in order to be healthy. All of those things have to be supplied to us. True, we have to work for some of it, but God has to supply this to each of us to be able to function. If you'll turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Begin reading here with verse 18 with the choices that mankind is required, ordained by God to make, verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, wrong choices, wrong desires, trying to strive for a way of life that pulls themselves out of that functioning role that God determined man was to fill. Verse 19, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And just taking the time that we have thus far and thinking about the creation, the functioning of it, God's purpose, his ordained role for all of it, these scriptures say that in it is clear what God's character, 
his attributes, his name, it's all revealed within it. I mentioned at the camp out, one thing that I like to do whenever I am where I should be is especially on a Friday night to go out here on the deck or sit down on the patio and just look and watch. Just to think about God, what he's doing, and look at life all around me. But it's been a while since I've been out there on the deck or down there on the patio. Just because I know that it's the right thing doesn't mean I'm going to choose the right thing. It means I can be distracted. I can come to a point where I no longer look out there and see the purpose of God, to see his name, his character, his attributes, and learn from it. And as verse 20 ends, because of all of that, especially those of us who have eyes to see and ears to hear, it is evident and available to us so that they are without excuse. If we fail to fill the function that God has ordained day after day, night after night, declares the attributes and the character of God. It's all around us, but we have to choose to take the time to see. Verse 21, because although they knew God, they did not glorify God as, glorify him as God, nor were thankful but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. The wrong choices can lead us to a point to where our understanding can be darkened. No longer when we look at creation do we see God. Do we think about what he's purposed and ordained? But as we talked about last week, a logger can look out here at a forest, and all he sees is work. He doesn't think about what's out there. A farmer can look at their fields, and all they can think about is how many acres I have to till, how many crops I need to pull in, without thinking about God and the functioning of all of it. All of us can fall into a spot to where our heart, what we desire, can be darkened. Verse 22, professing to be wise, they became fools. Even though they're not thinking about God and what he's purposed, his plan, they profess themselves to be wise. We're going to get into this as we move forward. And change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. The creation should teach us about the invisible attributes, mind, and character of God. It should cause each of us to give him full glory, not ourselves, and to be thankful for all the needs that he supplies for every single one of us, whether we're talking about on a physical plane or spiritual plane. He has to do that. The absolute need for each person to acknowledge God as provider and protector and maintainer is clear for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. Having that knowledge should lead us to choose to glorify God and grow in gratitude toward God. That, too, is clear. Questions that I would like to ask. How well do each of us, this is going to require each of you to look at yourself, how well do we choose to function within the spiritual or physical creation as God directs? Do we use the knowledge in creation to help us learn how to function among ourselves? Do we learn what creation reveals as God's knowledge to help us function as family? Can it help us with our roles, 
within our physical families, within marriages, parents and children. Can it help us? Day after day, night after night, declares the character, the purpose of God. Can it give us direction to help us with our roles within the body of Christ today with all the confusion we see? So the title for the sermon today is God's Ordained Purpose. As we move forward from here, there's going to be three major points that creation teaches us that can help provide structure for our lives. These points are not ends in themselves. I'm not saying that there's not more than three. I'm not saying that these three are even going to be given in a way to where there's not more that could be added. I think scripture makes clear all of our knowledge, whatever we have, it's only in part. No matter what sermon we listen to, no matter what Bible study we do ourselves, what we receive is going to be in part. And that part is going to be what God supplies, same as in creation, what God supplies that we as individuals need to function within the situation and circumstance we find ourselves. First point, thing that has been emphasized in these scriptures, the God family is to be glorified above all. Nothing should be above him. Creation teaches, that, teaches us that there is nothing in it that is self-sufficient. Everything relies on God to provide, protect, and maintain everything within it. We are different in that we have the opportunity and ordain to choose the direction of our lives. But we cannot forget that God must supply all our needs and direct our steps if we are to function as God ordains. If you turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter 3. Begin reading here with verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. As we have heard many times, scripture is God-breathed. It comes forth from him. Again, needs that are supplied, it comes from God. And is profitable for doctrine, that law, that guide, that direction that we are to follow, for reproof, which has the meaning of a conviction of a sinner. So he gives the truth, he gives us guidelines, but it's up to each of us to choose to acknowledge when we fail. If we don't choose to acknowledge that we fail, what God gives here, these four steps, stops right here. And we're not going to be able to function as God determines that we should. But it goes on. And as we go on, it's each point added to the next. We require doctrine. We require reproof to be corrected, to show us where we're wrong, and that instruction guiding us to do what's right. But it goes on. For correction, which has the meaning to restore to an upright position or a right state. So once we receive the instruction, we acknowledge our guilt God's purpose and what he ordains is that we now are brought to an upright state. We're able to function now. He's given us direction. He's given us teaching. We have admitted we're wrong. We look to him. We glorify him, not ourselves. And he restores us to a functioning position. And then it goes on for instruction in righteousness or as the margin has, training and discipline, application of truth. It requires all four steps for each of us to be able to function, whether we're talking about a physical family, a marriage, parents and children, children to parents. 
whether we're talking about the body of Christ, it requires all four of these steps. If it's stopped at any one point, we're not equipped to function as God ordains. As you can see, at any step here, if we choose to take ourselves out and not look to God and glorify him, but begin to glorify ourselves, we're taking ourselves out of a position to be able to function as God has determined that we do. We could use revealed scripture. If doctrine is given and we understand it, if reproof, if we see that we need to be corrected, at that point we could stop and we could use what God has given and do nothing but to just correct and judge someone else. That's obvious for all of us. I would doubt there's any of us that are in this room or listening or in the church of God that has not been guilty of that from one point or another by degrees because we think we know. You need to live your life like I live mine. It's not what God says. But we have the choice. God gives us that choice. We could use it just to prove our own opinions and grow in our own perceived importance to everybody else. Make ourselves more important. Can we see that if we would use doctrine, reveal knowledge from God that we understand that way, that our own heart, what we desire, would darken? No longer is it the light of God that is important to us. It's our own light that we shine, that we want others to see. It's not God that we're glorifying. It's something else. Please turn back to 2 Timothy chapter 2, just back a page. We begin reading here with verse 14. It says, Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord, not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. And again, with everything that we've experienced in the church, have we not all been affected both ways by participating in it and by other people trying to dispute toward us? We've experienced it. We see the fruits of it. Have we learned our lesson? Will we not do that anymore? Is it okay just to walk away and not have to win every argument, but to walk away following God's instruction, not to dispute amongst ourselves. Verse 15, be diligent to present yourself approved to God. Not to be approved to one another, that's not the ultimate goal. Yes, we want to get along. Yes, we want to have the same mind. But our overall attitude has got to be to be approved by God. That he be happy with what we do and function in this life. A worker, not someone who sits back and does nothing. We're going to emphasize that as we go forward. But it's a worker who does not need to be ashamed. You're functioning as God determined. Rightly dividing the word of truth but shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. There's no profit that will ever come from it. And their message will spread like cancer. And he gives an example. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Gets back to that four-stage process. There has to be change. We've been called to a way of life that's going to involve change from the time that we were called to the time 
hopefully that we have the opportunity of setting foot into the family of God. It is a life of change, admitting that we're wrong, correcting ourselves, being purified in God's service, looking to him, glorifying him. Verse 20, but in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor, some for dishonor. And no doubt, each of us could look at our lives and we could see ways where progress has been made. We don't give ourselves credit for that. We do not take credit for that. Only God can make that happen. We can see that there is progress made, but all of us can look at our lives too and see things that we've got to get rid of. Wood and clay, things that are perishable that we've got to get rid of, corruptible things in our minds, in our hearts, all of us. In a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor, some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, set apart, and useful for the master. God can use someone who's willing to do that to function within, as we're going to see, not just the physical creation, but the spiritual creation as well, prepared for every good work. Flee also youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart, not one that's darkened, but one who is oriented and can see their purpose. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they know the truth. Intermixed with all of these instructions is God supplying every aspect that's needed. As we're going to see, not only to those who are able to help correct, but to those who are doing wrong and need help. And we've all filled both those roles. And that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. A wrong teaching from any of us, whether that be in front of a lectern, behind a lectern, or fellowship one with another can hurt someone else. It's important any time we rise from bed to pray to our God to guide and direct everything that comes forth from us. The last thing any of God's people want is to hurt anyone else. But for me to stand here, to look back at my life and to say it's never happened, that's a lie. We've all sometimes have to learn by making mistakes and seeing that what God says in his word, if we choose the wrong way, there are penalties that will be paid. Have we not all experienced that? If one is used to help others, it will not be to glorify the self, but to glorify the God family. That person should understand everything that comes forth is from God. There is something that I want to think about here and add under this point. If you have been around the church of God for many decades, you can probably remember the teaching emphasis at various points in time from within the church concerning God. There was a time where the emphasis was mainly about the Father with very little mention of Jesus Christ. Because of that, today, there are those who resent it to the point that all you hear is Jesus Christ with very little emphasis about the Father. As Mr. Lee used to say, you can make the mistake by going to one ditch and then crossing the road and going to the other ditch. 
But either way, you're still in the ditch. There's something else that has to be added. Scripture states that Jesus Christ is the head of the church with that role given to him by his Father. Because of that, many can come to think that Jesus Christ is the main one that supplies our needs. I want to go to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to begin reading with verse 5. This is Christ's own words. We cannot dispute this. Chapter 6, verse 5. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. In other words, an actor on a stage trying to present yourself as something that you are not. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. He's talking about public prayer. Now, we can read these verses and all of a sudden come to the conclusion that public prayer is wrong. If that's the case, we shouldn't have opening or closing prayers at services. That is a public prayer. We shouldn't have blessings for meals. That is a public prayer. But what's being addressed here is the attitude behind a public prayer, not for the attention to be turned on oneself to where they receive fame and status. He says, Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Whatever they achieve with what they're doing, that's all the reward they're going to receive. It's going to be very temporary. Verse 6, But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father. The emphasis that Christ gives is prayers are prayed to the Father. Nowhere in Scripture do we see directions to pray to Christ. Nowhere. Who is in the secret place and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. We pray to the Father. The Father gives us what we need. Verse 7. When you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Again, we can read this verse and we could say we should never make repetitions in our prayers. If that's the case, Jesus Christ was wrong in the Garden of Gethsemane because he prayed three times, as the Scripture says, the same words. Repetition in prayer is not wrong. It's the attitude behind it and trying to think that if we keep saying the same thing over and over, we're finally going to get God to do what we want. That's not the point. It's the attitude, again, in prayer. Verse 8, Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. As we're seeing here, it's this relationship between us and the Father that's being expressed. In this manner, therefore, pray. Think about what Christ is saying we need to pray for. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're praying that the will of God be done and the prayers that request goes to the Father. Verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. That can involve physical needs. That can also involve spiritual needs. And who are those requests made to? It's not to Jesus Christ. It is God the Father that we make those. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our Father is very involved in our individual lives. And under this point, as we think about glorifying God, it is not just Jesus Christ. 
to add to this, John chapter 15, to give us a clearer picture of this relationship with both God and Jesus Christ. We'll begin reading here with verse 1. Christ speaking, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Both are going to be pictured here involved in your life and mine. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. It's not Jesus Christ. It is the Father takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he, the Father, cleanses prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Now Christ changes the emphasis from the Father and gives his importance in our life. Abide in me and I in you. As we're going to see this analogy, we come forth from Christ. We're going to see this as we go forward. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. As we can see, it is both the Father and Jesus Christ are absolutely necessary for every single one of us. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me... You can do nothing. Without the Father, we can do nothing. Without Jesus Christ, we can do nothing. It's his example that we look to. We come forth from that. We reap the instruction in life, in real life situations, from that to guide us how to function in life today. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you shall be my disciples. This analogy clearly depicts the true nature of our need for both of them. That's why I titled this point that the God family needs to be glorified above all. Both of them are absolutely required for all of us. It is not that we emphasize the Father and speak little of Christ or emphasize Christ and speak little of the Father it's not right. Both are heavily involved in us being able to fill our God-ordained roles as they ordain for each of us to be able to function. We need both, and both should be worshipped with a proper balance. So this point is that the God family should be glorified in our mind and by our actions above all. And no matter where one is in their own conversion process, this is something that we must maintain what we have today, not lose any ground, but we must grow from here. Increase that understanding and that dependence and that glorifying attitude for both of them. Second point, each individual cannot see themselves as more important than others. For this point, again, we can learn from creation. And we can isolate a tree. We can see that it is important for a tree to have good ground, to have rain, to have sunshine. If a tree could speak, they would say, those things are very important to me. It might stand out as being more important. They could look around at creation and see a lion. That one's not very important to me but all of these others are. Each part of God's creation serves a role, a purpose, but not every single part of creation serves every other part 
of creation. Each part is necessary and serves a vital role within the functioning whole that God has ordained. Please turn to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, we begin reading here with verse 24. It says, Now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. They were concerned about who was more important, who was going to have the highest role. And he said to them, Christ said to them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. He's looking at the world. He's saying, this is the way this world functions. He then goes on to say, but not so among you. He doesn't want us functioning like those who are under Satan's influence and direction. He wants us to function as he's going to outline. Not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger. And he who governs, as he who serves. What he describes here is a mindset. One that operates from. That an individual, no matter what their role is, will see themselves as small. See themselves as serving others. See their needs ahead of their own as being what they are functioned to do. Verse 27, for who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? That is the understanding of this world. If you sit at the head table, you're important. You are served. Christ says, yet I am among you as the one who serves. He operated from a mindset that was pure and perfect according to what God had ordained. It's from this vine that we must grow out of as a branch, that we must see and understand that we need. Christ operated from that perspective and we must do the same. Each individual must see themselves as part of a functioning whole. We can't help everybody. Just like there are parts of creation that are not for other aspects of creation, we can't help everybody. There are some people we come into contact, perhaps we can. But if we are able to, we've got to take this mindset just to see ourselves as small, what we have to offer is only what God has provided. It's not what I have. It's not that I'm more important or more needed. The self-image is vital to functioning as God intends. We are inundated today by Satan through this society that there are classes of people with some being more important and valuable than others, thereby worth more than others. Can we not see where this idea originates from? Lucifer began this whole way of life by looking at himself as being more important, more talented, could provide more, had ideas that others hadn't had, and it darkened his heart. And he began to pursue a life that has produced nothing but pain and death and hurt, and he enjoys it as long as he's the most important. This is a battle every single one of us have got a battle. This is not going to be easy. It's so easy for us to be distracted and influenced by this world, to look at ourselves and to think we're more important than others, more knowledgeable than others, more experienced than others. But as we're going to see, no matter if we're strong or weak, all of us have got to remember point number one. God supplies all needs. God is to be glorified above all. 
especially ourselves. We cannot be sucked into what Satan desires from us. But that is a choice each of us have to make. That's what God has ordained for us. You'll turn to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. Begin reading here with verse 1. It says, We then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. There are going to be situations in this life where we're going to have answers that others need. And there are going to be other situations where people are going to have answers that we need. Just like creation, we're not self-sufficient. We don't have everything we need. And how God chooses to fill those needs, not all the time comes directly from God. But sometimes it can come from a brother or sister within this family to help us see. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. It gets to this mindset, looking to serve others, their needs ahead of our own. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus. And the same operating mindset that he had that we would come to have. Each of us aren't there yet. Each of us still have periods where we're going to have to acknowledge, I'm wrong, I can do better. God purifies us, helps us to see, so that we can function better within our physical families or within the body of Christ. All of it is needed. In these verses, though, it is stated that some are strong and some are weak. We may be weak in some areas and able to receive help from those who are stronger than us or others have needs that we fill. In verse 3, Christ is stated as approaching his role as one who is more concerned about others. And all of us have to come to that same mindset in order to function and truly help one another. But I want to continue to focus in on the strong and the weak. Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. Begin reading here with verse 14. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and des delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability, and immediately he went on a journey. As we begin to think this analogy through, as we look out at creation, there are some aspects of creation that serve a more vital role in aspects of creation than perhaps others do. Here it is stated that some are given five talents, some are given two, some are given one. All serve a role. God does not call anyone that does not have a role to fill. Each of us can at times bring ourselves to a point to say, I'm not worthy. Especially as we continually be corrected and humbled by trial, by situation, it's easy to find yourself discouraged, depressed, tired. But here God says every single one of these are going to be important. But God determines what role they're going to fill, how many talents are needed to fulfill that role, and he is the one who distributes them. His judgment, his purpose, what he ordains. Then he, who had received five talents, went and traded with them and made another five talents. 
Each of us, by whatever God's given us, as we apply them in life, as we try to help one another, if we learn that mindset to put others' needs ahead of our own and work for them, we can produce fruit. It's not us that's doing the work. It is God that is filling and adding to what he's already given. Growth, production. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. Verse 18. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. The choice for all of us we can receive our God-ordained role. We can be called. We can receive truth. But we can choose to take what God's given us, put our hands in our pockets, sit on a couch, and wait for the return of Christ. And not function, not help. As God-ordained, each of us have that choice. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents beside. He functioned as God expected, served, helped, produced fruit. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. The reward? I will make you ruler over many things. You've proved that you desire to function as I've instructed you. I am going to use you in a greater way. That day that we all look forward to. He also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I've gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, you have what is yours. God revealed truth. And the only thing he had, production in his life, was that truth back. No fruit. No work. We emphasized the word worker earlier. It requires work to do this, to function within this family. Verse 27, so you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I'd receive back my own with interest. Therefore... Take the talent from him, the one who chose not to function as I intended, take it from him and give it to him who has chosen to function as I intended. I trust this person. This person has proved to me, as he said to Abraham, now I know you. Each of us need to hear those words. And we prove that by how we live our lives. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have more abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away and cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. Therefore, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. God's judgment in this situation is what's important. How does God see us? Are we functioning as he instructed? Is our mindset more concerned about the needs of someone else than the needs of ourselves? In marriage, is the wife's concern more for the husband than for herself? Is the husband's concern more for the wife than for himself? Are the parents concerned more for their children their welfare, their teachings, than their own time that they're required to sacrifice. It's involved in all aspects of our life, this mindset. Here's another lesson from creation. A tree can only use what other aspects of creation make available. 
if the ground gives what's required and the sun shines, but there is no rain, do the sun and the ground try to generate rain? No, because God didn't ordain them to do that. It was not the role they were given. And given that there is no rain, do the sun and ground give up doing what God appointed for each to do and fulfill? Can we use that in our relationships with one another? We can't do what God has not given us the tools to do. We can't. We can try, but if God hasn't ordained that for us, it won't work. The answer to these questions seem obvious. We are part of the body of Christ. We can only do what God has assigned us as our roles. We can only offer others what God supplies to us. Paul said, I'm able to speak in part, but what I'm able to give, it's only what God's given me. Clearly says that. And it's the same for every single one of us, no matter what our role physically or spiritually is. Perhaps in some cases, during life, by the production of fruit, by proving yourself to be faithful, that God perhaps will add gifts from time to time. But we have to be careful here. Many within the church... Because in their eyes, the ministry has not fulfilled their role, take on themselves the role of an elder without being ordained. That cannot happen. It is very clear in Scripture that Jesus Christ appoints those who will fill those roles. We cannot take roles that have not been given to us. God has to appoint that and make that happen. If you'll turn to 1 Samuel chapter 15. You can see right now this may run a little bit over and so it may be something that doesn't get sent out. 1 Samuel chapter 15. By our attitude, these roles that God makes obvious where we can serve others, we have to understand that we are not more valuable or more important than others, but a vessel and a servant of God. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 17. So Samuel said, speaking to Saul, when you were little in your own eyes, were you not the head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? God cannot use someone who doesn't view themselves as small, working for God. Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. Begin reading here with verse 2. It says, Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. If any of us are distracted to the point to think we are more important, we are more needed, we stick out and should shine more than others, Christ says right here, that person, that attitude will not enter the kingdom of God. It won't happen. Therefore, whoever humbles himself, makes a choice, works for this attitude of the little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And who did Christ say would be the greatest? The one who desired to be the servant of all. Fill the role that God's given them. This is another attitude that we must be active in striving for to maintain what we have, not lose any part of it, 
but continue to grow in it. None of us have achieved what we need. Third point. I'm going to wrap this one up as quick as I can. Each individual must be healthy if true help can be given to any other aspect of the creation. Here, I want to isolate farming. Crops can profit from fertile ground to supply the nourishment it needs through its root system. Requires rain, requires sun. If the ground is not replenished with the necessary nutrients, the crops will not profit. We have before us, as part of this creation, choices mankind has made not to honor the land Sabbath. Not allowed land to lie dormant once every seven years. And because of that, nutrients are sapped out of the ground to the point where sometimes it may take years to regenerate. So to substitute for that, we add fertilizers. We try to add man-made chemicals to replenish what we see is not there. It doesn't take long to see that the profit we receive from crops is not what it should be. Natural disasters can happen that seriously fun affect the functioning whole. Tornadoes, floods, droughts, hurricanes, forest fires that are going crazy out west. All that are allowed to happen affects the functioning whole. Please turn to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. I'm going to start reading here with verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. If God has made our role available, situations, circumstances available to help, and we're able to do so, and we choose not to function that way, the profit that God gave to an individual to offer to someone else doesn't happen. They don't profit. The health of an individual, spiritual health of an individual, to be able to offer that service is absolute. If you turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Begin reading with verse 3. For I say, Paul speaking, through the grace given to me. Paul emphasizes right up front what I'm about to give to you is coming from me. It's by the grace given to me. It's what God has given to me to be able to function in this role. To everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. Members within the body, some may be given five talents, some may be given two talents, some may be given one talent. We shouldn't be comparing ourselves among ourselves to see how many talents each of us have. It's not a race in that way, but it's a God-ordained function within the body. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. That analogy that Christ gave of the vine and the branches, we're all connected to the vine, we're all the same plant. This is why at times I find myself, corporations can serve a purpose within the church of God. But when it continues to separate us, and cause us to think in a way that separates us, how can we truly function as the body of Christ? It can't. 
I'm not saying if all of a sudden we all just became part of one congregation that that would work. It wouldn't. God has separated us to help us learn lessons so that, you know, sometimes people think we all need to be small congregations. If that's the goal, I don't know what in the world God has got planned because he's planning for the largest group of people that has ever existed to be one, functioning as a whole. That is what we are to learn here today. Whatever it is that God has put before us that we are to fill by what he's provided for us. We have focused on these three points, and throughout each point, it is obvious the need for the God family to supply all the needs each of us have in whatever way they choose to give it to us. I am not saying that these are the only three points to think about. I'm not saying they're ends in themselves. I'm saying these are major points that Scripture points out we have to be aware of. We are now between the Feast of Pentecost and the Feast of Trumpets. One of the lessons of Pentecost is that God is not just dealing with individuals. In the Old Testament, we see example of that, where a lot of times it was just one person called and used to help people try to honor a physical covenant. Beginning with the Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, it's obvious now that God is calling many people at once to where we have congregations. It's not just about individual callings, but it's about learning how to function as family. We have an opportunity here, as those do in Portland, to function as a family under God, honoring, glorifying him, the God family, not just him, the God family above all. We have that choice to make. We have the choice to make to see ourselves as small. We have the choices to make to improve our spiritual health and condition so that we can help as a functioning body, congregation, to profit as God intends by the gifts that he's given. That's a choice each of us have. But unfortunately, we can look at the condition of the body of Christ today or even our own lives and see that we are far from perfect in serving one another. And it is obvious that the whole has suffered because of that fact. Each have scars and sensitivities that are part of us that can lead us to make excuses why we should not serve and pray for others in the body of Christ. But God knows his family's condition. We're not the only ones who can see it. If we think God doesn't know what things are, what we see is a part. He sees the whole picture. If you'll turn to Isaiah chapter 40. We'll begin reading here with verse 27. It says, Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God? Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary? His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Those who wait, continuing to function as God has ordained, shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. If we don't grow weary, 
discouraged, depressed. If we can keep from looking at the condition of the body of Christ and seeing no answers, our faith in God should surpass all of the problems that we see. Somehow, some way, God is going to make this work. And it is going to be an inspiring thing to witness, to see how God can take a confused body of people and make them one. Only God can do this. There is no important person that can do this. It is God. We are privileged to be able to be waiting to witness that. Last scripture, Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Begin reading here with verse 25. It says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? Or how in the world is the body of Christ going to become one? For after all these things, Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. No matter what our needs are, even if we don't see them, God does. Verse 33, all of us need to hear this. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. As we stand here today and we think about our roles and our purpose within the family of God, above all of it, intermixed through every point we could add to the three that are here, the faith of God is an absolute through all of it. Let us just think about these things, and as you have time, sit on the deck or a patio or whatever you have. Just think about what God's doing, his purpose, his ordaining of things, and ask him how any of us can fit within that and work as a vessel of his, not of ourselves. Brethren, there will be some announcements after the closing prayer, so if you would please just remain near your seats. Uh, we can get those taken care of uh, right away. Um, for our final hymn, if you'll please stand, take your songbooks, open up to page number four. If you're using the older hymnal today, 25 if you've got the newer one, we'll sing, Give ear unto my words, O Lord. Again, that's page number four in the old, 25 in the new, after which I'll be giving the closing prayer.
Our loving God, with Jesus Christ at your right hand, guiding and directing all that is done and said in this Sabbath day, we thank you so much for your dominion over this world, this universe. We thank you, Father, for looking out after each and every one of us as we live this life. And Father, we do pray that you will help us in every aspect of studying your word, to take in that true spiritual nourishment that makes us healthy, allows us to grow as part of that vine. Help us, Father, to, as we grow, to look to you, to look at the other members of your called out family. Help us to be able to be there for them as they need us as we grow. Help us to always view ourselves as small in our own eyes, great God, that you can continue to work with us. Help us to be humble in that way, Father. And we know, great God, that all of this is not for our individual usage. It is to give glory to the God family and to fulfill the role that we've been called to now to be growing in that grace and the knowledge of our elder brother, Jesus the Christ, so that we can eventually be the kings and priests of this world tomorrow, Father, teaching all men in your perfect and righteous ways. Father, we do thank you for the love that you extend to us by opening our minds to your scriptures. We thank you for our calling. We thank you for your great and awesome plan that marches on. We do pray now, Father, that for your dismissal, for our safety, and we just thank you, great God, for all that you do for us. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.